Hello and welcome to your lecture on ecology and cooking. So we've been talking so much about culture and how important it is for humans to learn things that determine what is food and what they eat and how they cook it. But I think it's also really helpful to take a step um, to the side and think about how environments and ecologies also structure cooking and eating and food by constraining what's available. And this includes not just the ingredients, the species that are around that are edible, but the tools we have to make use of them and the fuels that we have to cook them and the seasonality in which they're available. All of these things together constrain what is food, how we cook it, and how we eat it. So let's talk about ingredients first and think about what types of local species are available. Humans have done really well um, extracting and enjoying the species that grow in their environment naturally, but humans have also taken matters into their own hand and made more types of foods available. Now we've already listened to a podcast on domestication of animals. So if you remember the Why These Animals podcast, they discussed what types of animals made good crop <laughs> species. Um, and why they were originally domesticated. And one of the hypotheses is that they weren't originally domesticated for eating. So chickens, the hypothesis is that they were domesticated originally for ritualistic practices. Um, and if you look at this chart of uh, cow species, domesticated cow species from Africa and Asia, this is done in 1904, interestingly, um, you can see that the animals are may maybe haven't been domesticated for all of the same exact um, products as um, other domesticated ungulates. And cows, in fact, produce a lot more than just meat. Of course, we've talked about milk and lac the, the gene culture co-evolution of lactose tolerance, um, but they also provide traction in terms of pulling a plow, and their byproducts, their waste, can be used as fuel and fertilizer and even um, flooring materials. I lived in a house, when I was doing my dissertation research, I lived in a house that was, um, the floor was made out of a mixture of mud and cow dung, and it was the most um, durable, cleanest local floor ma material available. So animals can be domesticated for a variety of reasons, and once they are, some of their products can be used as food. Now, of course, humans have gone to great lengths to also acquire non-local species through long-distance trade um, on waterways and overland. So the spice, the Silk Road and the spice trade that traveled from Eastern Asia all the way through Western Europe brought many new products in both directions. And this is a picture of nutmeg. Nutmeg was probably the most prized of all of these products at one point thought even to be able to cure the plague, worth its, more than worth its weight in gold. And it was used in medieval Europe as far back as the eighth century. And up until the mid 1800s, nutmeg only grew on one island in the world, which was kept secret by the Arab traders um, who brought it northward, eastward, westward. Um, and this island was conquered by Europeans in 1512. Um, and these islands in Indonesia were called, by Europeans, the East Indies. And this is what Columbus set out to find. Um, and not only do they grow nutmeg here, but other spices like pepper, cinnamon, cardamom, ginger, and turmeric. All highly desired spices in the past and continuing today. And we've heard about some, like the story of pepper, in our book on eight flavors. And this desire for exotic foods is one of the many things that set off the Colombian exchange. This was this widespread transfer of animals and plants, culture and people, technology and ideas between the Americas, the Afro-Eurasian hemispheres in Asia in the 15th and 16th centuries, the very first inkling of globalization and the way that ideas and products and food began to move around the world. So, a lot of the foods that you've associated with regional cuisine, like tomatoes in Italy, um, wasn't possible until the Colombian exchange began because tomatoes originated in South America and traders brought them back to Italy and it took hundreds of years to incorporate them into the cuisine. 
and they're originally called the Death Apple. I'll tell you about this in the next um, slide when we discuss silverware, why people were so resistant to the tomato. But the potato, the potato was originally um, thought of as animal food, but by the 1840s, Ireland was so dependent on the potato for human food that um, the proximate cause of the Great Famine was a potato disease. And maize and manioc that traveled from South America to Africa have now replaced sorghum and millet as Africa's most important food crops. New staple crops moving to Asia from the Americas, like maize and sweet potatoes, um, also contributed to the population growth in Asia. Coffee and sh uh, from South America and sugar cane from sh South Asia were both grown as cash crops in the Caribbean islands and became um, the main export commodities of very extensive Latin American plantations. Chili and potatoes from South America have been in a become an integral part of Indian cuisine. And it's really mind-boggling um, to think about before the Colombian exchange, there was no oranges in Florida, no bananas in Ecuador, no paprika or paprika in Hungary, no potatoes in Ireland, no coffee in Colombia, no pineapples in Hawaii, no rubber trees in Africa, no chili peppers in Thailand, no tomatoes in Italy, and no chocolate in Switzerland. So we really have a lot to be thankful for with this um, incredible movement of food across and between continents to really diversify the diet that we have available to us today. And I think, um, especially with the food supply chain problems over the last year, it's become readily apparent um, just what maybe what we've been taking for granted all our lives in terms of availability of local species to really cook whatever we desire um, as long as we can afford it right we'll talk about we'll talk about that too later on in the class okay so the tools that you have at hand really affect how you can transform your food into food um, theoretically edible items into something actually edible and we we discussed pots to some extent how they really released humans um, so many more nutrients and calories to humans. Pot's an incredible invention. Um, but knives as well, right? How we chop up food and how we can butcher animals and um, crack nuts and extract these high quality but hard to get um, ingredients from natural products. And I mentioned I'd talk about metal a little bit more. Um, Something we definitely are used to having around in our homes today are stainless steel um, utensils, so forks and knives and spoons. Uh, before stainless steel, uh, which really became came into the majority of households after World War II, before World War II, most people didn't have stainless steel. They had pewter or some other type of metal um, or even wooden utensils. And the thing about pewter is that it interacts with acids kind of the same way copper does and it can give you a really bad taste and can also potentially be poisonous as well and so if you imagine people trying to eat spaghetti sauce with pewter utensils or on pewter plates um, it's either going to taste terrible or poison you or both and so you could see why people who didn't have access to non-pewter utensils in Europe, say in the 1600s, might have called the tomato the death apple. And in fact, people used to have special silver forks and knives when they were eating fish, because oftentimes you put um, lemon on fish, which is an acid. So you'd have to have your special um, silver uh, fish knife or, and fork so that you, your fish would still taste good and not poison you. Um, and another very interesting thing about utensils, if you want to think about the ecological consequences of the utensils that we use, chopsticks are a great example. So wooden disposable top chopsticks have been used um, since the beginning of the Japanese restaurant, restaurant industry in the 1700s. And this is really disposable chopsticks were really the only way to assure clientele that what they put in their mouths was not defiled because traditionally it's 
basically like wearing someone else's underwear to use someone else's chopsticks. Everyone has their own personal chopsticks and you would not use somebody else's. And so if you go into a restaurant, you definitely would want to know that your chopsticks were not defiled. Hence the solution, disposable chopsticks. Um, unfortunately, this has become a bit of an ecological disaster. So Japan now uses and discards about 23 billion pairs of chopsticks a year. And China... Um, 63 billion pairs of chopsticks. And in fact, the demand for disposable chopsticks is too great for Asian forests. And Georgia in the U.S. now manufactures and exports billions of disposable chopsticks to Asia to fill the gap. And so now there's been um, these counter movements like bringing your own bags to the grocery store. Uh, there are campaigns to bring your own chopsticks to the restaurant to help avoid the waste of using all these disposable chopsticks. Another interesting thing about chopsticks is that they go perfectly with the type of knife that is used to prepare um, Eastern Asian style cuisine, which is um, usually bite-sized pieces that are then picked up with the chopsticks. And this knife seems to have co-evolved along with um, a certain type of energy usage and the use of the wok and stir-fry cooking. So I'm going to talk about energy next in terms of how ecology can affect cooking. What type of energy source do you have? And how much energy do you have access to? One of the United um, Nations Millennium Goals is to decrease essentially energy poverty because a lot of people around the world um, are lacking sufficient energy to prepare food and do cooking. So the two is a Chinese cleaver, for lack of a better word, and this is a picture of several different styles of two here. And it really is a one-stop shop knife. The two can do pretty much anything. It can, sh it can shave the finest slivers of vegetables. It can um, butcher a chicken. It can chop things into the perfect uniform pieces that are desired in, in high ch Chinese cuisine cooking. And it really pairs beautifully with wok cooking. So this fast hot sear, high heat sear of these bite-sized pieces um, in sauces that are quickly reduced. And that can be kind of paired with what's available on hand. So you have a few vegetables, some meat, um, kind of like we've discussed with chili and curry. You can use the combination of ingredients that you have to make Continually different, continually delicious, um, variations on a theme um, to really make the most of what's available. And wok cooking go is, rises alongside the deforestation of Eastern Asia. And it works wonderfully well in an area where there's not a lot of fuel wood available for cooking. You can concentrate a high amount of heat at the bottom of the wok. It dissipates up the sides. The food is cooked rapidly because of the small sizes of the bites and also the high amount of surface area that comes in contact with the size of the wok. And it really is a tribute to cooking efficiency. And so the lack of fuel wood, the design of the wok, the design of the two to cut the pieces into the sizes they need to be to go into the wok to cook efficiently. And thus the chopsticks um, all really go hand in hand um, for a cuisine that's tailored to the local or at least constrained by the local ecology. Similarly, we've also seen households in other countries like England um, switching towards more efficient heat sources as landscapes have been, become deforested. But for a long time, low population density and a high availability of temperate forests in England made a very inefficient use of fuel and cooking, such as over open fires, possible. So you'd see hearths and poor homes that were also a source of heat for the house, um, but you'd have a pot boiling over the stove. We've talked about pottage and one pot meals in our previous lecture where you could dump in what you had. You could have a spit that you could put over the fire for roasting, which meant that you had to have a member of the household turn the spit for many long hours, usually the lowest ranked member of the household. And there were many inventions to remove this source of labor. And so I've 
also included a link to a uh, radio um, podcast about turnspit dogs. So please make sure to catch that and how there was a special breed of dogs to run in this wheel that had a rope attached to the spit. That would then turn the spit so a person didn't have to do that. But with the deforestation of England and the rest of Western Europe, Cook's eventually turns towards coal, which was disgusting for its own reason. Coal fires and indoors are just recipes for disasters. Um, then gas and eventually electricity. But people were really reluctant to move away um, from this open fire to other heat sources. As we've discussed, since the hearth was the symbolic center of the home, and we still, many houses in the U.S. still maintain the symbolic um, hearth inherited from this cultural trans cultural tradition. Um, so, if you, you know, turning to our, ourselves now, if you think about what a truly local cuisine in Idaho would look like, pre-Columbian exchange, you know, people have been living here for at least 14,000 years. We're not really sure how back um, occupation of Idaho, human occupation of Idaho goes. Still looking for data excitingly, but people have done an amazingly good job surviving in our part of the world for thousands and thousands of years. And I just saw some recent archaeological data. It looks like populations um, in the Snake River Plain have been were considerably better off than um, in other areas like Lake Bonneville Basin. So obviously they're doing quite well for themselves. Um, what do you think a truly local cuisine in Idaho? If you were only to eat local native species to Idaho. Okay, I'll give you a second to guess. Pause if you need to. Then I'll give it away. But here's the answer. Um, yeah, lots of grass seeds, sage, chokecherry, pine nuts, wild potatoes, deer, marmot, rabbit, antelope, trout, salmon, a really wonderful, um, diverse, delicious, in my opinion, diet. Usually there's a few people in the food service industry, sometimes even some cooks and chefs who have I've asked to design a local Idaho cuisine um, and have come up with some really delicious sounding things in the past. I mean, all of these things taste great, right? Um, and this is the, this what is the traditional diet of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Paiute tribes who've lived in the area and have ancestry here and whose lands we currently occupy. And a, um, they also faced some challenges like seasonality and how to deal with the changing seasons. So if you live in the tropics, this band around the equator where the sun reaches a point directly overhead at least once a year, um, it would be very rare, if not unheard of, for temperatures to ever get below freezing. Um, you see this, this band around the equator of continual production. And fig trees are a great example. Figs make fruit all year round. Um, primates, humans are primate, other primates love figs. And most other primates are relegated to this tropical band. Um, but humans, humans have been, become increasingly canny with our cultural abilities to learn how to essentially store food for later seasons. So some, some folks, like if you live in India, you'll have a monsoon season, a wet and a dry season, where you get this um, annual rotation of vegetation and fruiting plants. Um, so honey, for example, is seasonal in India, coming up right on the wet season when the flowers are all blooming and the nectar is flowing for bees to make honey. But in equatorial Africa, honey is not seasonal, as bees have access to flowering, uh, flowering flowers year-round. Um, a lot of times you'll see anthropogenic burning, and this is when humans create very small-scale um, wildfires that, that are kept in control to seasonally burn down vegetation to improve hunting ability and visibility during the dry season. And... Um, Anthropogenic burning has been going on in some ecologies for so many thousands of years that now the, these ecologies are actually adapted and do better with small-scale, regular um, anthropogenic burning. Now, if you live in a temperate climate like Idaho, you're going to have four seasons, and you've got to store food for winter and early spring where there's just not a lot of calories available on the ground. 
Um, and the Arctic, where humans have also done a great job surviving and making and thriving and making a living, you're going to have even more extreme seasonality, which usually means a reliance on meat that you can store um, and domestication of, of meat animals like reindeer, if you live in Siberia, for example. Um, a reliance on seafood and seals and fish um, that can that can are and are available year round and in the winter that can solve these temporal production patterns. But humans have been amazingly creative in how to preserve and store food. And if you live in a seasonal climate, the goal of preserving and storing food is to prevent food from decomposing and going rancid which means that you need to slow the growth and reproduction of organisms like bacteria. You need to prevent the oxidization of fats and the workings of enzymes that cause foods to decompose and go rancid. And you want to, at the same time, maintain or even create nutritional value and also texture and flavor, right? If you have ever been living in an area where you had reduced access to seasonal fresh foods, think late winter, early spring, um, you're aware of how, how nice it is to have a little variation in texture and flavor as well at that point of the year. Um, historically, some, some of these methods that I'm going to talk about drastically alter the character of the food being preserved and in many cases these changes have become desirable quantities so um, preserving milk into cheese and yogurt uh, pickling onions fermented cabbage okay so ways that humans have been able to preserve and store food um, first of all one thing you can do is take advantage of long-lasting foods potatoes are a great example of this on their own they are storage organs so they naturally come prepared to resist the growth of bacteria and um, enzymes that decompose foods internally and roots and tubers like potatoes and sweet potatoes and manioc and um, chemis bulbs, onions, um, have worldwide been preserved, chosen, um, domesticated, chosen, preserved, picked, stored, um, because of their storable properties. Another thing you could do is probably the oldest, besides choosing while storing um, food products, is to dry foods. This is going back at least 12,000 years. Uh, and the point is to remove the water that bacteria need to live. So before refrigeration, for example, butter was really heavily salted. You put a ton of salt into the butter, it removes all the water, and it makes your milk product last longer. But you can see here um, trays of drying tomatoes in the sun and a piece of salted cod, so heavily, heavily salting fish some people argue that the cod industry and the salt, because we could access salt and salt cod changed the world. Of course, these are always fun arguments to make. But drying, salting, and smoking all remove the water and slow and prevent the growth of bacteria and preserve the food um, longer than it would be on the shelf. Another thing we can do is heat food to kill microorganisms. And if you've ever made yogurt in your kitchen or instant pot for example you know that the first step is to boil it and if you've ever made um, jam or uh, pickle relish to preserve food from your garden I know a lot of people got into canning last summer um, you know that the first step is to boil it to help kill um, some of the microorganisms that that are live in and on the foods that you're trying to preserve Pickling and brining are another great way to preserve food. So this is putting, pickling is, and brining more generally is putting food into an edible liquid that kills microorganisms. So a brine is very high in salt. Um, you can pickle things in vinegar that microorganisms don't like to live in. Alcohol and oil. So oil has very low water content also. So if you've had a sun-dried tomato in oil, or uh, a pickled cucumber, or olives or tuna in a saltwater brine, 
These are all ways that have been used to preserve these foods for a later date. And with, with pickling, many of these foods, as I've already said, are heated first, so sometimes it's a combination of all of these techniques together. I love fermentation. I think it's a super cool way to preserve food. It's when f you feed food, so it produces this lactic acid. And the two great examples are sauerkraut and kimchi. And once the foods break, begin to break down and produce the lactic acid, uh, this waste product prevents further growth of microorganisms. And sometimes <laughs> the process of the yeast in the food eating um, the sugar products produces the lactic acid and sometimes produces carbon dioxide, which is how we get beer. So beer is start, started by fermenting the mash before it um, begins to turn into beer. So fermenting is a really cool way of letting food break down at the right speed so that enough of these bacterial pro waste products build up and prevent the further growth of bacteria in the process, changing the flavor and the texture of the food. Sugaring is one that we often forget to think of these days, um, but sugar also is a way of taking the water away from the bacteria and microorganisms, which is which also kills them. And so um, you may have had um, canned peaches, which are preserved in syrup, um, or other types of candied um, citrus peel, or something that's been soaked in sugar. And finally, of course, living in our modern world, um, freezing is an option for us. And freezing is quite interesting because ice really changed the nature of seasonal eating. Combining um, aspects of the Columbian Exchange with freezing foods means that we often have access to fresh fruits and vegetables all year round. So foods like peas can be picked at the height of freshness midsummer, um, blanched and processed and frozen, and stored in the fridge or freezer until ready to be thawed. And lucky us, we get to eat lovely fresh seasonal peas um, all winter long if we can afford them. So freezing really changed the seasonal nature of eating. Besides, outside of this um, reliance on preserved foods, but the ability to access fresh foods, fresh foods um, seasonally. And ice heralded in the age of the refrigerator, first the ice box and now the refrigerator freezer combo. And the fact that we can store food at cold temperatures um, for much longer. And some people go even further and say it also allows it also creates a space that needs to be stocked. And if you look at the the refrigerated section of the grocery store, it's really expanded in recent decades, creating this illusion that you need to have, you know, a stack of yogurts and cheeses and meats and vegetables. I mean, I've given you this little cartoony version of a, a fridge here that you have a cultural idea of what a stocked fridge would be and a certain satisfaction in achieving that ideal. Now, of course, you can evaluate that on your own. This is a class on critical thinking as well. Um, but the nature of frozen peas is so widespread that almost inevitably in um, visual media productions like TV and movies, if someone gets an injury, what do they do? They reach into the refrigerator for a bag of frozen peas to put on their injury, what have you. Right? And so it's almost an expectation that you would have a product like frozen peas in the freezer um, to hand when desired. Okay, some interesting food for thought. Check out the podcast on Turnspit Dogs. And I look forward to reading your food journals this week.